Hello, welcome to um, Desert Island 2. Today we have, as usual, me, Conrad, and we have Will. Hello. Um, as I guess, we have the third member of Diddly Dumb, Doc Who. Uh, the second me- the second member, te- technically. <laughs> technically. <Yeah>. Alphabetically. <laughs> third in the recording order. So, um, have you got anything to, um, before we get into it, have you got any sort of interesting things to say about um, Diddly Dumb? <laughs> <laughs> the that we have that we've all, uh, already gone through with Alan. I wouldn't know. I, I don't know what you said here. Of uh, Diddly Dumb podcast, or as it's starting to become known, the Two Hour Time Lord. Um, <laughs> no, I imagine they've told you everything, haven't they, about how it started? Yeah, how it started. Um, yeah. The Blue Box podcast. Curious, really. We uh, before before we started, we didn't, we didn't actually, actually met each other or spoken to each other. So it was an entirely uh, out of the blue sort of thing. Um, it just uh, it's one of these things that you think your oh, podcast is going to be a pain but it's, uh, as soon as you start arranging things it starts snowballing you arrange things like uh, iTunes and a blog and a logo and a name blah 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 and it just seems to go from there so um, how do you um, come by the name Doc Who um, I can't remember I think um I think I probably reached a stage at which uh, I um, I was disillusioned with the forums, and so I I was setting up uh, a blog of my own, and I was trying to think of whatever name really, and I just came up with uh, Doctor Who. I've been told that um, I can occasionally be far too um, uh, pernickety about grammar. So I have an idea. It might have been a, a, it ends a joke about against myself, but I can't remember. So, um, should we go on to your um, your list now? Let's. And we'll start off with your your first choice. And your first choice is a story that um, features John Pertwee, and it's the first to feature his um, mortal enemy. <laughs> Yeah. It's Terror of the Orchards. Three months of delicate work, and now look at it, your ham-fisted bundender. But this whole place might have gone up in flames. My dear young lady, steady-state micro-welding always creates more smoke than fire. Well, it completely sums up the poetry your era for me. Uh, I'm happy to accept that um, stories like Inferno are uh, artistically better, and probably far more groundbreaking as far as the evolution of uh, Dot 2 is concerned. But I find this far more enjoyable. Uh, what's one of my rules in trying to work out these um, eight stories from a desert island? Uh, could I see myself watching them over and over and over again? Um, and I could with this one. Um, there's hardly, hardly any padding. Uh, and it works really, really well when you consider that it's such a quick return for the Autons. Uh, it's only been about 12 months since they first since they debuted. Um, I think that shows how almost infinitely variable they are as a monster. Uh, they didn't even have to... They had a huge success scare-wise with the shop window dummies. But they didn't have to repeat, even have to repeat that. So you get this, this succession of truly scary scenes like the Auton policeman reveal the orange um, doll, the plastic armchair, the daffodils, those giant grinning carnival heads, which were the scariest thing for me. Um... And, of course, as you say, is a debut of, the, for me, the only master. Um, he, Roger Delgado is not just the best master there's ever been, but for me, he's the only master that's ever va- even vaguely interested me. Because none of, it, none of his successes had anything approaching his, his sort of naughty charisma. Uh, Anthony Amy was a bit too much of a, a hopping jack and apes. The rest of them... I didn't do anything for me. Um, but maybe the, the best it reaches is um, a dirty Jacoby. But then he's only the master for about five seconds, isn't he? Yeah. Before he regenerates. Um, and that's why when people say, oh, 
so and so has apparently been cast for the new series. Will he be the master? Which is always the, or if it's a woman, will she be the Rani? Uh, it, never, it never really interests me because the character doesn't interest me. Because Roger Delgado's performance has always interested me. Um, the best quarry scene ever in Doctor Who, and that that would make this story stand out uh, if nothing else did. Uh, it's the Autumn policeman falling down the cliff and then getting straight up without barely even um, a stumble. And that, that is wonderfully done. Um, you, you, you guess another of this, this one of Joe's bizarrely inconsequential phone conversations which crop up throughout her era. She's, um, she's ordering new parts on the phone in the lab and she's talking to this man in, this, in the stores and she calls him a Dolly Scotsman. You're a Dolly Scotsman, Mr. Campbell. You are, you are, you're a Dolly Scotsman. I think she's strangely um, bizarre. Um, but yes, brilliant story, and I could watch it over and over again. The, um, it was the, the novelization uh, I, I came across first, um, and that's, that's really well done. Uh, and that's what I've got to say about it. What do you think, boys? Well, I've, um, I've, I remember reading the novelization, and I don't remember a lot about it. I haven't seen it. Uh, though I do want to see it because I do think I haven't seen enough Pertwee I've only seen uh, only a uh, select few Pertwee stories and I think because this one is a very important one the introduction of the master because yeah. the master sort of he is used in an awful lot of Pertwee stories and some say he's overused but um, this is before any of that yeah it's a it's a very um unique story because it presents the Doctor um, with an adversary that is not only a member of his own race, which of course the the meddling monk was, but he's also an adversary that is equal to the Doctor Mm. in wit and sophistication and intelligence which means that it's a different sort of challenge for the Doctor to overcome the Master, the, the, the enemy than it would say be with the meddling monk or with some of his other adversaries because the master is in some way so similar to him but obviously he's the moral opposite to the doctor that was something that was intended by the production team at the time to make oh, him yeah, sort of like yeah. the the direction was it like the moriarty figure yeah and I, I think that makes it a, not only a very unique story but a very enjoyable story because you can see the way that the Doctor, Pertwee's Doctor, interacts with the Master in a way that we don't really see the Doctor interact with other Time Lords because uh, during his trial he you know, was uh, quite disregarding of them. But with the Master, he seems almost grudgingly um, praising of him. You know, he sees that he's an intelligent person and a, uh, an adversary equal, if not surpassing in intellect to himself, that he can't just take down by sending the TARDIS board of Batman. Of course, they have the TARDIS working then, but, you know, he's, he makes the story unique, I think, and it's very enjoyable. Your next choice is a story that is also the introduction of quite a, a classic monster, and it's also a Pertwee story, it's a later Pertwee story, and it's the Time Warrior. I am a Santarin officer. My name is Lynx. It's he's astonishing. I have heard tales of his Eastern magic. <coughs> Sarah Jane at her very best. I don't think they ever write her quite this well ever again. And that's saying something considering how good she is throughout her, um, her era. Um, admittedly, if she'd spent her whole era distrusting the Doctor, she'd have been come a right pain in the neck, wouldn't she? But um, apart from that really toe-curling line at the beginning, uh, oh, Doctor, don't, can, candy, don't be so patronising, they wrote her as, as an independent female character without descending into, I think, with some of the, some of the writers they had in that era, they could very easily have descended into right taking out the mic, the Mickey out of her as a sort of um, a stereotypical women's liver. 
which they do. And if you ever see the, uh, the time, not the time warrior, but the time monster, there's uh, a scientist in that call. I think she's called Ruth, who is almost written as if they're taking the, taking the Mickey out of um, what would have been called in those days women's lib. She's awful. But Sarah is absolutely fantastic. When you see her, she first comes up into, into the castle and they drag her into it. And you could imagine possibly Joe or certainly someone like Victoria sort of screaming, saying, oh, no, no, please let me go. Well, Sarah, she's really, really strong. She's like, get off, get off. She's brilliant. Well, what about Dot... Um, oh, what's she called off EastEnders? Dot Brown. As a sort of East End Rapunzel. Who's, um, oh, ragwort, henbane, love in a mist, fennel, sesame, I'll smoke anything, I will. She's absolutely brilliant. Um, and the other, as you say, the other thing, great thing is the Santarans, because apart from possibly the Santaran experiment in about a year's time, I don't think they're ever this good again either. Um, they become uh, visually, uh, they become lousy from invasion of town on, time onwards. And I, I don't say I don't like the modern Sun Towers, just like little schoolboys to me. Um, and of course, we've got Hal the Archer, later to become Boba Fett. Uh, absolutely brilliant story. What do you think? Um, I haven't seen this one. I nearly picked it up when, like, years and years ago, and it was like, it was advertised as, like, all Sarah Jane's first story. This was when Sarah Jane was like, Social Adventures was just recently started, and um, they were sort of sort of using that to promote the Time yeah. Warrior. But I didn't. I've never. I've never actually seen it, and I would. I do want to see it because it's, um, you know, such a landmark story. And I have got a lot of poetry that I haven't seen, but you know, it's high on my list. It's it's a great uh, classical story, as you say. They they deal with the character of Sarah very well, but they also deal with the reveal of the Santaru very well oh he has to take his helmet off yeah and he takes his helmet off it's a it's a great way to reveal a monster that that they sort of haven't really done since um the daleks in dalek when the the plunger moves towards barbara it's this sort of brilliant moment of suspense you know what's beneath the helmet and he turns around and you see this horrible contorted potato like that it, it it really it really deals with the setting very well as well. It it, it capitalises on the medieval castle and the idea of the Santaran being seen as the star warrior. It, mm. it uses it to great effect and the way that um, the the people of the medieval period interact with Sarah, who's of course a women's material. I think it, it really does that well as well. Of course, it's not Doc Brown, is it? It's June Brown, who plays Doc Cotton. Yeah, I thought I thought, I thought that was so strange, that. I haven't seen EastEnders, so I wouldn't know. Oh, well, I, would, I wouldn't get the DVDs if I were you. So your next choice is an um, obvious one, but the fact no one's picked it yet. <laughs> you know, seen as one of the best stories, it's just a bit of a surprise. It is Genesis of the Daleks. Well, I'm nothing if not predictable. Do you know that the tiny pressure on my thumb, enough to break the glass, would end everything? Yes. I would do it. The earliest story I remember was John Pertwee's penultimate season, uh, the season before Time Warrior. Uh, but um, they say your first doctor is always your doctor, but it was always Tom for me. Um, as soon as he regenerated, that was it. I was head over heels with him. And if I hadn't been um, being very uh, uh, tactful and diplomatic, I might well have just bothered, gone on and chosen about eight of his stories instead of trying to spread them around a bit. Um, but there's this stuff that's coming up now, which I could just watch over and over again. Genesis of the Daleks. This is great in the same way that Blink is great. Because uh, while Blink is a great story, despite being Doctor Like, it's a great Doctor Who story, despite being Doctor Light. Genesis is a great Dalek story, despite being Dalek Light. 
or on pass I could be really daring and venture that both stories might might be great because they're light in the primary characters. I mean, to be fair, the Daleks have been dull, had been dull for years, uh, unless you particularly find it entertaining to listen to stage directions repeated ad nauseum. You know, I am travelling through the forest, I am travelling through the forest, I am travelling through the forest, I have located the Thals, I have located the Thals, pursue, pursue, my vision is impaired, my vision is impaired, I cannot see. Not something that particularly entertains me, um, like dialogue-wise, I have to admit. Um, I will confess that in the olden days, when we Doctor Who fans had to make our own entertainment, uh, I was given the LP soundtrack of Genesis one Christmas, um, so most of the dialogue is burned into my brain forever. Um, I think it's, it's, for in my opinion, all, class, all Dalek stories and all Davros stories can be divided into two groups. Um, Genesis and everything else. And Genesis is out on its own as um, the best Dalek story and the best Davros story. Because after Genesis, he's just reduced to a ranting loony. Because although Davros is physically monstrous, in Genesis, he's actually given motives and, and characterization here. He's even given a philosophy. He actually interacts with the colleagues he works with. He even has a history with them. Uh, you, you could actually believe at some stage, it might be unlikely, but at some stage you might have chatted with them about, you know, something other than just dominating the, co- the cosmos. You know, where he tells one of them, uh, no, you're not going to betray me, are you? You've got a, a little th- a machine in your heart that keeps you alive that I designed. Uh, it's lovely that. Well, one of the first things we ever hear about him is, oh, you can't be aliens because Davros says there's no intelligent life on other planets. And he must be right because he's never wrong. And so we think, oh, he's going to be some ranting megalomaniac lunatic. But the first, one of the first things we, we hear him say is, that, uh, yeah, the power of travel through time and space is beyond my comprehension. But it's not beyond my imagination. And, oh, that's brilliant. How many of Doctor Who's nutters? say things like, you know, I could be wrong. I'm prepared to admit it. And although the the, the famous lab debate with the doctor about, um, you know, if I hold in my hand a, a file containing such a, um, a virus is justly famous, um, I, th- I think it's unfortunate to, to overshadow slightly the other great uh, debate speech, which is where he's in the, the main lab trying to win over all his friends. Because you know, really, that whatever happens at the end of the debate is going to bring the it out <clears throat> well shall we say I don't want to spoil it for anyone who's not watched it uh, but people who oppose him are kind of end up um, dead uh, he's, you get the impression he's genuinely trying to win people over to his point of view he do really get subtlety of motive usually in Doctor Who and of course um, they don't just give us Davros they give us the glorious Nida too and something I, I realised the other day while re-watching it is not only do we get uh, Lieutenant Gruber from Allo Allo in, um, but we also get uh, the, the Thal guard who dangles Sarah briefly off the scaffolding to a torturer, um, goes on to become General von Klinkerhofen. So what more could you say? I couldn't say any more. <laughs> I um, always love Genesis of the Daleks. It's one of the first ones, classic stories that I saw yeah. for obvious reasons. And I think the um, I think they should never have brought Davros back. I think absolutely. This, the, I mean, he was he's never as good. Although Terry Malloy, did, um, you know, he put in a, a good performance in some of them. But I just think, I mean, because I recently saw Destiny of the Daleks, and I, I, I enjoyed it to an extent but the Davros was just so disappointing me because it was nothing like the Davros I'd seen in Genesis it was just uh, it just could, that could be anyone it's, there's nothing distinguishing he's not like whereas in Genesis he is like sort of like they were based around the Nazis weren't they and he did yeah. seem sort of like because the Nazis people forget were sort of were sort of just people you know they, but you know they were they and people were capable of such evil is mm. one of the interesting things about Nazis and why they are used in like film and TV so much and I think that was I think this is um, Terry Nation's best scripts and it's just the um, 
mainly because I, I do agree that because the, the darks on it as much because you focus more on the the human aspect the human behind it and how someone mm. could do such a thing that create Daleks that we know are evil how someone could do that uh, I agree with everything you said it, it, it's a great story it's uh, it's a case of less is more in this one with the Daleks because it's it's because it's showing their origin it doesn't need to show a whole fleet of Daleks but for quite quite a lot of the time it's just one Dalek or yeah there's only about three in total I think aren't there yeah so it's it, 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 it sort of you know it's more about the psychology of why someone would create the Daleks and how they created the Daleks as opposed to the Daleks just going around shooting things mm. mind you although I agree that less can be more what I always think is, if less is more, just think how much more more would be. Mm. The sort of thing is, like if there had been a big Dalek invasion and like added it into Genesis, it would have sort of spoiled the the charm, yes. wouldn't it? That you that like Terry Malloy, like um, like Terry Malloy's like Dalek, Dav, when he was Davros, his start there was a lot of Daleks in them stories. Um, which sort of took away from it and, um, in sort of resurrection maybe or, or, um, or even David Goodison in um, Destiny there's a lot of Daleks in that but it's yes. just you, if Davros is there he should be the focus rather than I know obviously he's the t- objective but he should be like the only you shouldn't have really have Daleks and Davros combined and the way they brought him I think bringing him back sort of cheapened the idea the novelty of sort of seeing the creator of the Daleks mm. now your next choice is another very um, popular um, Tom Baker story from his early seasons and it is um, Terror of the Zygons this one they call the Doctor is a threat to us already he has found out too much he must this, I've got utterly um, beautiful memories of this. Um, for those that know, of course, it's the end of a, of a continuous series of stories with the greatest TARDIS trio ever, um, the Fourth Doctor, Sarah and Harry. Um, starts with the Ark in Space, uh, or arguably starts with robots, and then goes on some Terran experiment, Genesis, Revenge, and ends with Terror of the Zygons when uh, Harry disappears and unit um and if you didn't know i mean it i I suppose any scots listeners might say oh we knew straight away i think if you didn't know you'd assume it actually was filmed in scotland rather than sussex or wherever it was it's it's so well um and couple the tardis trio with possibly the finest monster design ever in 50 years even the dalek design i would suggest is arguably great now only in the sense that it's become iconic. Um, it doesn't, or it doesn't actually, however much we, we, we may actually genuinely be scared of it or think, oh, doesn't it look cool? It doesn't actually, if you look at it too hard, look br- like a brilliant design. Uh, but the, the Zygons, oh, and they even get a superpower to make them genuinely different. They can change into different people, and it's topped off. With the, well, one of the best things about them is that they're whisper. They don't rant and rave and scream at people. They say, uh, you admire our technology, <laughs> things like that. And it also has one of the genuinely self-soiling clean cliffhangers at the end of episode one, where I think it's uh, Sarah's on the phone, and she just turns around, you get a, a, a brief second of a glimpse of a monster about to attack her, and it goes off into the credits. Very, very good. Um, got great character actors like John John Woodnut, uh, who's appeared in so much Doctor Who. Um, and this is this is Tom. This period of Tom is him at his zenith. He's got this sort of restrained, bubbling power in his acting. Um, there's no there's no silliness. It's just uh, utterly glorious. 
And that's what I'm going to say about potato Zygons. Um, like, see, the Zygon design, like, sort of holds up today, and that is, I think, why they were brought back for the 50th anniversary, like, because um, they hadn't been seen, like, since 1975. Like, uh, yeah, they were still brought back and still scary in 2013. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I think that's why, um... Because, um... Wasn't, uh, wasn't it Stephen Moffat said, like, there were some people in the BBC who said, oh, why are we bringing these back there? You know, and he said, well, you know, it's such a good design. Yes. Why, why yeah. not? <laughs> I mean, on their own, the fact that they could shapeshift is neither here nor there, really. It wouldn't be enough uh, argument to bring them back for the anniversary. Because, I mean, you could just introduce a new shape-shifting monster, couldn't you? I mean, it would be very easy. I mean, it's not like a... It's like it's There's enough of them, aren't they? It's yeah. not like you see the Zygons. It is just the, the design that's why they were brought back. And um, cause I, I, I've, I've read the novelization for this ages ago. I can't remember much about it. And I've, I have um, sort of got a sort of thing where... I'm trying sort of, not going to happen anytime soon, but sort of head towards completing classic Doctor Who DVD collection. And I, I want to save Terror of the Zygons for last or close to last because I don't want my last story to be like Time and the Rani or something. <laughs> I want it to be a good one. So I, it's one of the ones I'm reserving. So your next choice, you've chosen another Tom Baker. You can tell you're a fan. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but like a lot of us seem to be. I think all Doctor Who fans like Tom Baker. I don't think you can be a Doctor Who fan and not like Tom Baker. But this one is the Brain of Morbius. Morbius. Doctor, but you're all right. One of the most despicable, criminally-minded wretches that ever lived. Doctor. There are some of us who would not agree with that, Doctor. This is on a par with uh, stuff like Pyramids of Mars for me. But I chose it over Pyramids because I could watch it over and over and over again, which presumably is the point of having it on Desert Island. Yeah. Um, it's possibly the most obvious of the Hammer Horror borrowings uh, with the Frankenstein um, motif. But I, th- I know it was Philip Finchcliffe who said this or Terrence Dix um, when people complained that the... Uh, they borrowed too much from uh, other genres. He said that, uh, no, all our stories were based on original ideas. It's just that there were somebody else's original ideas. Um, and I, th- I think if it's done well, who cares if they've pinched stuff? Um, so long as the, the story rattles on along at a good gallop and the characters are engaging, the SFX, the special effects and the sets, it never really mattered at all. And in fact, the sets on Khan are very good. Uh, you get you get two whole new mythologies opened up by this story. Whatever Morbius did to get put on trial and executed, and the sisterhood, and we actually know find out very little of what Morbius did beyond the occasional lines from Maren about oh he you know, he brought an army to Khan and he um, he did oh terribly wicked things, but just those few lines paint the scene. Wonderfully. We also actually very know, know very little of the sisterhood, beyond the fact that they've been worshipping this flame for donkey's years. Um, oh, and a wonderful revival of them in Night of the Doctor, the week before the anniversary special. Uh, I thought they were, they were absolutely glorious in that. Um, but because the best thing about Brain of Morbius is Philip Maddock. Um... Uh, and he, on his own, that'd be fantastic enough. We also get Cynthia Grevel as Maren, uh, Michael Spicer's voice as Morbius, Solon. Philip Maddock is the best type of villain in Doctor Who, which is like I say about the, the Master, is a, a charismatic one. He's got to be someone where you feel slightly sad when he dies, um, not because you wanted his evil plans to come to fruition, but just because you think, oh, oh I'm not going to be able to see him delivering these fantastic lines anymore. Um, uh, what, and um, we get little nice little things like the Doctor's little lecture on death being the price we pay for progress. Uh, lines like um, the, the impossible dream of a thousand alchemists dripping like tea from an urn. Uh, Chop Suey, the galactic emperor. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I could watch it over and over and over again. And that's all I've got to say. You'll have to on the island. Yeah, you have to watch it over and over again. But, um, 
Yeah, this this one uh, is another one I haven't seen, but I, I very nearly bought it on DVD recently. This uh, went with a Colin. This other went with a Colin Baker one, which I regret now. Um, <laughs> the the um, I have I've read the novel ages ago and sort of s- spooky, sort of dark horror aspect of it really stood out to me. I really enjoyed it as a child. Because, you know, um, and like the design of Morbius, if you look at the design of Morbius, obviously that wasn't in the novel, but if you look at the design of Morbius, it's just sort of so um, mismatched, you know, bits of yes. everything, but yeah. it just works so well. <clears throat> and to think, because Morbius obviously is a time lord, so he's the... To think that's the same, um, that that creature... Mm. Should be in like a body like the doctor's a human body, and would have been when he did all his, his crimes. Yeah. Just to think that, like, think that, like, because you can sort of imagine, because it's the same race as the doctor, sort of imagining the doctor in a body like that, how wrong that would be, and then you see that. Well, you would have thought, wouldn't you, the sensible thing to do, they would chop the, chop the doctor's head off, and they'll presumably want to sew it on top of that monster. You just thought a sensible, sensible thing to do is just slice off the top of the doctor's skull, replace the brains, and put the skull back on again, wouldn't you? Yeah, maybe. Everybody thought it through a thing. You know, Morbius gets its, um, uh, what's, the, what's the servant's name? Um, Condo's left arm. What if Morbius wakes up in his new body and we realise he was right handed? <laughs> <laughs> you have to just make do that claw, wouldn't it? Yeah. And actually, having said that about those other lines, the, the one my, probably my favourite line is where they're in the the, hall, the upstairs hall of Solon's castle, and the monsters advancing on them, and Doctor's sort of pushing Sarah behind him to protect her. He's saying, "Keep calm, Sarah. Sarah, keep calm, keep calm." He glances behind him and says, "Oh, you are calm." <laughs> I love things like that. Some yeah. like really. <laughs> um. So the next um, story again, do you skip an awful lot of Doctors here? Uh, five, six, seven, eight. And we go on to Doctor number nine. Well, I have to confess that uh, the the Legopolis was a big turning point for me, the uh, Tom Baker's finals. In fact, actually, uh, I've, I think I've said before some places that after the Key to Time season, City of Death is the only decent story for me until uh, the seasons revived it the series revived in 2005 because I I couldn't when when he rejoined his nephew Peter Davison I could only think it's Tristan off our creatures great and small because he was so such a well known face and I, I couldn't make that leap I mean now I can look back and say oh what great what great guys the three successive doctors were but uh, oh you've come to what possibly comes closest to the uh, Peter Hinchcliffe era of Tom's uh, reign for me, which is the Christopher Eccleston season. Now, I was considering choosing the end of the world until I heard that Al was going to choose that. And so I thought, no, I'd better choose something else, which suggests a level of coordination between us, which will astonish any regular listeners to the Diddly Dumb podcast. Um, but uh, as I think you've said, or I can't remember if you already said, I've chosen uh, for the next one the double bill of the empty child that Doctor dances, which for me is out on its own as the best thing has ever been in the fifty years. Please let me in, Mummy. You all right? Please let me in. You mustn't let him touch you. What happens if he touches me? He'll make you like him. And what's he like? I've got to go. Nancy, what's he like? He's empty. Season one. The Eccleston season was a complete joy for me. And even in New Who, only possibly only Matt's first season comes close to it. It was a whole season where we had n- genuinely had no idea what was coming next. I've never been one who's had a problem reconciling classic and uh, New Who. They're both different enough and similar enough for me to make comparison pointless. Uh, I was entertained by Rose, amazed by End of the World. I had my hair stand on end in Dalek. I actually, for the first time ever in Doctor Who, I cried in Father's Day. But I spent this two-parter constantly having to retrieve my lower jaw from my chest because it's absolutely brilliant. Um, 
this is possibly the only for me. But it is in fact, it's definitely the only time in fifty years that Doctor Who genuinely manages to to achieve the feel of a genuinely epic scale. Uh, I think. I mean, I, I, don't get me wrong. I love stuff like Parting of the Ways. The final one of the Eccleston season, where you've got all those millions of Daleks pouring out of their ships into space. I think it looks glorious. But that that's not epic for me. Um, especially nowadays, how you know it's all done on a computer. Uh, or, you know, in a couple of seasons later, moving planets around in order to destroy the universe. That's not epic for me. Um, that, the battle in part in the ways, is like turning up a Rolling Stones CD just to maximum volume. Um, the Empty Child the Doctor Dances is like Mozart being played by a full orchestra in a concert hall. It is utterly glorious. Uh, and the way they achieve this epic scale is not by having every, you know millions of monsters and huge buildings and everything. It is by putting the, our heroes in a situation of which itself has intrinsically has vast significance. World War II, of course, generally in the world, and the Blitz to uh, domestically for us, and allowing both the story and the characters then just to have room to breathe. Uh, obviously, coupling it with the um, great breadth of imagination we've got here, um, I've heard it. It's been argued a lot of the times that, uh, oh well, you know, you could you could have told this story in a single episode, but why would you want to do that? There's so much texture in here. Stuff like the, the kids around the dinner table doesn't really need to be in there for the plot, does it? But it's wonderful. And there's um, and, Stephen Moffat admitted it's, 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 I think it's the scene where you hear the um, it can project its voice over the different thing and yes, they're in it. Yeah. So send it to a screen. This is its room. That was padding. But he said, oh, yeah. but no one noticed at the time because it was because <laughs> it was just such a great scene. Now I I love. Um, I love Christopher Eccleston's Doctor because he, he was my first Doctor. And, um, oh, you lucky thing. I, I adore him. Yeah. I, and, mean, um, I, I mean, I, I must admit, the, I'm a sort of Mancunian myself, but, uh, so, and even then the, I do find that his, um, his accent occasionally grates. So I, I don't think that... I think well, I can quite hear, understand the Doctor speaking in a Mancunian accent. I can't believe... I can't imagine him saying stuff like, uh, as he says, the thing in the end of the world, oh, I didn't think that was going to happen. No, the doctor doctor may be northern, but he wouldn't drop his H's. No, 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 no. Uh, but scenes like the, you know, that self-indulgent scene of Doctor and Nancy on the bridge, where he's talking about, you know, um, I don't know what you do to Hitler, but you terrify me. That's quite self-indulgent, really. But he's brilliant. Rose and the Doctor stuck in that room resonating concrete. And I have to confess, uh, that dancing metaf- metaphor went completely over my head on first viewing. It wasn't until I, I looked on the forums that, that night and saw people say, "Oh, it's all a metaphor for sex." I'm like, oh, yes, it is, isn't it? Um, and the, story, the thing about keep on this thing about epic, it's like stuff like the old stuff that was made in the fifties and the sixties, films like Ben Hur and Spartacus, which they attempt to recreate with things like, um, oh, what was the Russell Crowe one, Gladiator today. Uh, it doesn't quite work because those epics were a succession of they weren't they weren't really that much of a you know a, a rattling great story although they were but they were a succession of beautifully written and, and performed character scenes one going after the other um, which essentially is what this dub two parter is um, and it's because it's like that there's, there's one wonderfully intimate scene after another and after another. That you lose sense of time here. You're not constantly thinking, uh, "Oh, it's you know, there's only four, there's only 20 minutes of the show left." It's wonderful. If you look at the scenes of Rose hanging from the barrage balloon, with the Luftwaffe coming straight at her over a burning L- London, actually, um, it's slightly more cartoony than realistic CGI-wise. But you don't care because uh, it's the atmosphere you're looking for here. Uh, story's very well plotted uh, and leave. Apart from the nano genes' ha- strange habit, or convenient habit, of glowing or not glowing according to the, the, whether the plot requires it, um, the reveal at the end astonished me. It still love it, lads, still love it. Um, and one of the best things about this is the scripting. Uh, I love, um, and I've, I've I've rambled on at great length at this elsewhere in my time, 
Uh, I love uh, small and intimate writing, uh, where in, you know something, something that could be said in a whole paragraph is said in half a sentence. Uh, I love it. There's a bit where um, you know when they're, they're trying to get into the child's room in the hospital, at the top of the hospital, and the doctor says, "Oh, Jack, can, Captain, come up here and open it with your blaster." And while he's firing at his blaster, Rose sort of takes the doctor aside and whispers and says, what's wrong with your sonic screwdriver? And he just gives her this meaningful look and says nothing. And you just know from that, oh, he's done this because he wants to see what sort of weapons Jack carries around with him. That's wonderful. Stuff like um, when they're talking about Volcano Day oh, and the sounds go off. What's that noise? Oh, it's the old clear. And the doctor says, oh, I wish. That's lovely. That two words, two places where you could say, "Oh well, actually, Jack, what you don't realise is that uh, that's not that may be the all clear as far as the Blitz is concerned, but as far as uh, our particular problem here is concerned, it's not the all clear at all. No, it's just you just had to high wish. It's only two words, but that's what's brilliant. That's what a brilliant writer for me. And of course, the the final one is uh, where it's in the, Jack comes in the tardies and says, "Much bigger on the inside." The Dutch is in this dirty look and says, "You better be." Oh, it's glorious! That's sort of I can't go on anymore about this because I'd just be taking up time. This, um, I, I do love this story, and um, certainly thing with Chris Rackles and stuff. I, I, that, there's, I don't think there's a single bad story in the first season. Even Boomtown, people go on about that being bad. Do you not I, see the? Um, I like that one. The long game, or whatever it was called. What was that one called? Um, long game. Yeah, the, um, okay. oh, I, I, that's I, the only one I thought was a turkey. I, I, I'm not. That, that's probably my least favourite. But even that has got some some great Good bits day, in. Yeah. Like you've got Simon Pegg and anything. But this, like MTR Doctor Answers, is one of the best. It's definitely up there. Um, and obviously you've got Captain Jack's first appearance, and he's because we don't know much about him. He's sort of more mm. interested than he comes later I mean I still like the character, the character of Captain Jack but he's much more mysterious he's much more mysterious I sort of like that sort mm. of um, I'm, I'm much preferring Doctor Who to Torchwood yeah same mm. um, I, don't, I don't I don't think he's he's very good John Byron at, at sort of being the you know the centre of attention <laughs> it's, it's strange but as soon as he came back to Do- you know when he goes back in Utopia and he's now he's now the Doctor's sidekick rather than main guy. He becomes brilliant again. I think yeah, I think I think Moffat should bring Jack back. It would be very good for maybe for like the tenth anniversary of this story, which should be coming up next year, which is weird to think that. Yeah. Um, I think the the most effective part of this is the um, Doctor Constantine is turning into um, mm, yeah. a gas moss zombie, and like for someone who I was seven I think at the time and I, that was very affecting for um, a young child but it sort of that is one of the things I re- most remember from early watching of Doctor Who and you know it's sort of one of the things that sticks in your memory and because because uh, you know um, a lot of people remember sort of hiding behind the sofa and sort of this, they remember the scary moments from Doctor Who when they're watching yeah. as a child and that is definitely one of them because it's just so horrific Mm. Oh yeah, the, 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 he's and, a, and apparently made bone it, it, even that was toned down from what they originally wanted, because they wanted to have it with the sound of his skull cracking. Yeah, as it caved in. <laughs> well, I was thinking for I don't know, nightmares for weeks if that had happened, but anyway. <laughs> um, um, so, what do you think of this one, Will? Uh, I completely agree with what you said. I think it's a very enjoyable story. It's a very spooky story. Um, it's, it's in a way, it's quite similar to your other picks in this list. In that, not only does it have um, similar to Brain of Morbius and Terror, it has condensed writing where it could have been stretched out more. But it also has these nice little touches. Mm. Yeah, it has these these really nice little um, moments. Well, yeah. I mean, like in Britain, almost there is absolutely no need in the plot for the Doctor to to um, well, slightly, but to give Maren a lecture on your pr- death being the price to pray for progress. There's a slight um, in- inclusion in the plot, but there's no really need for it. It's slightly self-indulgent. But that's what makes it brilliant. 
and it doesn't feel crowbarred in because it's utterly it's utterly Tom at that time. Mm, yeah. And this has got obviously the everybody lives moment, sort of. Yes. Which is well, I. Uh, it's not actually moment. that that bit that brings tears to my eyes. A bit that, that still makes me cry. This is about the like, series season one. I watch it now. I'll rewatch it for about the twentieth time. I still start crying at the same at the same points. Um, the bit that does it for me is where he's he goes up to has to um, oh Nancy has hugged the, the boy. And the doctor goes up to him to him and just pulls off his face his gas mask and he's another little boy again. That always gets me. Yeah, because um, Martha Cross quite- tries to re- create the everybody lives thing at the um, yeah, Silent yeah. Force of the Dead. It, it's never as really effective as it is. It, does, it doesn't quite work. It's the same with Davros cinema. That it works better in the story. Just once, yeah. It works better once in the, mm. repeating it. It becomes a cliche instead of um, when the story, it, the story that it originate, it originates in, it's much more effective. And your next choice is... Oh, this is, this is where I become unpopular. Who, who have I left out completely? Uh, well... Left out David Tennant. Yes, a, a certain person. Um, this story is the first episode to feature Matt Smith, and he's quite a popular choice among um, our other guests, isn't it? It's already been picked before in the first yeah. podcast. The Eleventh Hour. Hello. I'm the doctor. <laughs> Basically, run. I'm not. I'm not going to think against David. I mean, he's not. I'm sorry, he's not my um, my favourite. But I could uh, I could ooh ooh and ah about the um, the Satan Pit two parter. I think it's possibly the best introduction story ever for a new doctor. Uh, and a completely unique way of introducing a new companion, you know, through the eyes of someone 12 years after she first meets the Doctor. Uh, in fact, the story, really, is completely irrelevant to this, isn't it? Um, and you didn't actually say... I think I think um, they say Pat Troughton was one of the most important Doctors, because had he failed um, in taking over the reins from William, Tr- William Hartnell, they probably would never, wouldn't have bothered continuing the uh, series but I think Matt does as much because I think a lot of people were thinking oh it's all going downhill now from after you know Super David but during at the end of 11th hour you weren't exactly saying oh David who that would be rude but I think it's noticeable that in the recent Doctor Who magazine poll not only has the fourth Doctor returned to his rightful place at the top of the favourite Doctor charts but number two is now Matt Smith um, I think, uh, you know, in a sense, he's hopping about and flapping his hands all the time can disguise a quite a remarkable subtlety in Matt's acting. And in the moment that sold him for me, is you know where he rushes downstairs because they hear the cloister bell, and he says, oh, the, the engines are going to explode, I've got to disappear. And he sits on the lip of the TARDIS, and uh, uh, Amelia's just said, oh... You know, everyone says they'll come back. And he says, no, don't worry, trust me, I'll be back. And just before he jumps into the Tahadis, he briefly glances over his shoulder at her. And that the, the, the acting in that glance, it's amazing, so much meaning in it. Um, and you could, it could be argued that after, after David's era, we were quite sorely in need of a bit of histrionic nuance from the Doctor. Um, and the other, great, the other great emotional moment for me was where he's about to force open the crack in Amelia's bedroom and why another doctor might, might, might have pushed her behind him to protect her he actually holds out his hand to take hers and we're not quite sure if he's doing it to reassure her or he's actually seeking reassurance for, from her I think that's really important because the, the, the doctor for me must be vulnerable I don't mean weak and um uh, vulnerable to attack, but but how must be vulnerable in the sense that as a kid, you don't if, if the Daleks are attacking, you don't really want to care that oh, are they going to destroy the world? What you should you should be scared about? Oh no, they might hurt the Doctor. So that's why Doctor Doctor for me can't be a superhero or a god. He's got to be 
vulnerable, so you want to actually protect him. Um, and the scare is true, just as scares too. When Amelia runs, she says, come, I'll be back in five minutes, go and pack. She runs upstairs to pack her little suitcase. And, you know, she's running back and forth across the landing, you know, collecting a teddy and her wellies and things like that. And during one of those runs across the landing, you see that the secret door at the far end has suddenly opened. Now, when I first saw that, I very nearly soiled myself. That is so scary. Um, and uh, absolutely brilliant. That's what I've got to say about it. I've always um, liked this one. Um, it's pretty. Um, it's, it seemed to be um, widely appreciated, but like, it isn't never. I, don't, I think. Before doing topic, this podcast, I don't, I, I haven't really heard it brought up as one of the best. Yeah, it's not brought up as much for some reason. Even though it is, it is, it is it's, a, the story it's, itself is, 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 is pretty generic, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's it, Matt coming in that's uh, that's that's brilliant in it. That's the that makes it different from other yeah. stories with a perhaps similar plot. Also, um, Karen Gillan's first story. People kind of forget yes. forget that that it's not all also, about Matt. But obviously, it's Karen Gillan's first story outside of his name, Father Pompey. And also, Arthur Darvill's first story. And Arthur was first story as well. Yeah, the big story is it's sort of start of a whole new era of Doctor Who, really. And In, there's, yeah. there's no links at all to the previous production team, other than same music. No. Yeah. Which is yeah, the biggest old space, switch, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, but it's the biggest shift in spear from space. Yeah. I was yeah. all on Sleep Rose, but that was kind of bringing it back, so a new show. Yeah. But yeah, I always think this is a um, very, very big story, a very good story. I always enjoyed it, I, because it's there are some great, direct, great direction in this one. It's a very cinematic story, isn't it? Yes. yes. Fairy tale yeah. moments and stuff. I'm talking for a tale moment. So your next pick, your final uh, pick of the, the the TV stories, is quite in its way a dark fairy tale. It's another Matt Smith one. It's also his first series. It's Time of Angels slash Clash and Stone. Oh, and I could do with an air corridor. What was that? What did she say? Coordinates. Like I said on the dance floor. You might want to find something to hang on to. Well, I have to confess um, that uh, I would be satisfied with only about three minutes of this on the desert island. I mean, I like the rest of it. I love um, Ian Glenn as Father Octavian and the, the sort of concept of the uh, the, the church militant um, and the the, you know, the the labyrinth they're walking through. Um, I think the the angels are slightly diminished from the, as, as they all are when you're given a, a brilliant monster with a brilliant uh, superpower then if you bring them back you always have to reduce it slightly um, to to make the plot work but the best thing the, the best thing about me so that is for me it's one of the best things about Doctor Who at all is this pre credit sequence um, do you, you remember the opening sequence of the third Star Wars prequel uh, um, the, the very last one where they've got this gig- start with this gigantic space battle in orbit around a planet planet you know Doctor Who could never do that on its budget you shouldn't even try to and this opening sequence with River in Time of Angels Flesh of Stones sums up for me everything about how Doctor Who can score over the mega CGI budgets of Star Wars or Battlestar Galactica it's just in its sheer cheeky style uh, you come up with a, with a simple con- concept like, or silly concept like hallucinogenic lipstick, which allows you, in the middle of a, of a spaceship, to just go send out uh, some cameras to the nearest country park and film the characters in there. That's lovely, that. It's a little like, for me, the opening ceremony of the London Olympics. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but ever since the opening ceremony of the, pre- the previous on the Beijing Olympics, the media were, were constantly predicting that London's opening ceremony would be a, com- would be a miserable failure, an embarrassing by yeah. comparison, because we couldn't afford to do it on that scale. But of course, we don't, London doesn't need to out-Beijing the Chinese, because we aren't Chinese. All it needs to do is 
do whatever London the British are and to be, let's face it once you've seen something silly like the Queen jumping out of a helicopter who is going to remember the Chinese army using interpretive dance to tell the world that they invented movable, movable type you're not are you so you see what you get is these sorry to go on at length but the, you get the Byzantium's grey tunnel corridors which scream cheap but you've got Alex Kingston slinking along them with the camera not fo- not showing her but focusing on little, little details and a close, close-ups of her glossy red high heels um, taking a little silver gun out of her evening bag and turning it into a blowtorch um, through those, those dark glasses she's wearing the shields when she's um, uh, welding that box and then they intercut those actions with the doctor discovering the results of it 12,000 years later and that's where Doctor always triumphs it's it's the elevation of concept over scale. Uh, Star Wars gives you scale. Doctor Who gives you concept and ideas. And you, 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 to produce a whacking great space battle like in Star Wars, you need a whole lot of money. To come up with a brilliant, time-twisting concept like River's Escape Plan, which is bonkers but perfectly logical, which is what Doctor Who should be. All you need is a brilliant mind and the writer. So never mind the, the huge CGI, just set revel in sheer bonkers escapism. It's only a few months since the end of time where you've got the entire population of the Earth turning into the Master. And when I was watching that, I was imagining all the casual first-time viewers changing channels in their thousands. But now and then you get something like this, this pre-credit sequence of Time of Angels, which has got brilliant style, and he, he grabs the casual viewers by the heart and drags them along on the ride. I mean, it's absolutely fabulous. I mean, the rest of it's pretty good too. And bringing the Weeping Angels back as well works very yeah. well. Mm, yeah, because they 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 sort of they, they didn't try and do Blink again. They did yeah. something totally different with it, sort of in space and in sort of hundreds of them, sort of an oh, we're Weeping Angels. We hadn't something we hadn't seen before. Yeah, it's sort of um, because if they just tried to blink again, it would have just seemed right. seemed like a oh, well, what they're doing now? They're just trying to do blink again. Yeah, how how boring and typical. Whereas this is sort of different. I know some people don't think I shouldn't have brought the angels back, but you know I do think it it works in the way they've they've changed it. So um, you also in your list get to take a book and the book you have chosen is the Doctor Who 2005 annual I know this sounds a little um, pathetic doesn't it <laughs> but um, I will and I'll defend it by saying do either of you guys know what a brindigulum is no no <sighs> the youngsters today it's a Dalek word meaning to hold a conference or talk between four or more Daleks. And you would know that if you'd received Doctor Who and Dalek annuals for Christmas in the 60s and 70s. Um, this 2006 annual actually came out Christmas 2005, so it was a, an Eccleston and Rose, a uh, Billy Piper annual. Um, what it is for me is just the nostalgia. Uh, this has clearly been put together as a loving homage to the old Doctor and Dalek annuals of the 60s and 70s. So it's done exactly like they are. There's no attempt to make it, you know, um, brand new, glossy with photos. Uh, A lot of the illustrations are um, drawings and paintings rather than photos. You could have filled it with photos of the mocks of Balloon or something. But to do it's comic strips, all these long text stories. You have a story about five pages long in, in very close text on printed on the background of a drawing of whatever was being described, which was his archetypal old Doctor Who annuals. Ah, puzzles to solve. Like um, they used to do in the, in the 70s, they'd have someone who was... Um, stuck in a cell or who was on guard somewhere... What, keeping an eye on the Daleks, and he only had 25 cigarettes, and he had to somehow make 31 out of them. They actually did this in the 70s. Um, or surviving a trial on an alien world, where if you told a lie in the court, you'd be executed slowly. And if you told the truth, you'd be executed quickly. I can't, it sounds strange. And informative articles on the history of the show. 
Uh, just lovely, really. And there we are. This is the only annual I didn't get I <laughs> for a while because I, I wasn't massively into it. Obviously, I was totally watching it by then, but I wasn't like a massive fan, really, at first. It was only uh, by 2006 when I was a big fan and I got the, um, the David Tennant annuals. And I, I always thought they slowly went downhill. Yeah, and I, 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 haven't, I didn't get any of the Matt Smith annuals. I got some of the brilliant books, which I, I thought were very good, because mm. they were sort of like an annual, but sort of more interesting. Because <laughs> the, the annuals did get really sort of bad. cheap, and I never actually saw anything beyond this one, um, because I'd, uh, I'd, I just, I didn't bother. After this, yeah. so they became they started calling the Doctor Who storybook after this, didn't they? No, they that's so that the separate, that's yeah. a separate thing. Oh, was it? I, so I, I, think one this, I think this was sort of like the first prototype of the storybook, and they had the annuals and the storybook, and this yeah, is more like the story. They don't. Do, they stop doing the story. Do they still do annuals. They do like do they do yeah, like a twenty thirteen one? The fiftieth yeah. anniversary one, didn't they? Yeah, they're doing one so, for yeah. Capaldi as well. I've seen the artwork for it. All oh, right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So they still do them. Oh, I don't know. I, I'm not really interested in the Andrews anymore. It's <laughs> they didn't do the brilliant book after. They only did two of them, and they stopped doing them. Well, they were good. So anyway, um, your, ah. your other piece of merchandise... <laughs> Well, you know, you know, I said that the empty chair on Doctor Dance is possibly the finest thing ever done in fifty years of Who. Yeah. I may have to retract that and replace it with this, which is an yeah. audio cassette I was given for Christmas when I was ten years old, and nice. it was the audio cassette of Doctor Who and the Pescatons. Oh, now, this I have is, that on CD. This is entirely about nostalgia for me. Um. This is what, uh, in the olden days, when our Doctor Who, fa- Doctor Who fans used to have to make their own entertainment where the show wasn't on TV, it was either the target novelizations or nothing. So to actually be able to hear the Doctor and Sarah's voices whenever you wanted was unheard of. I must have played this cassette in bed night after night after night, to the extent where... I, about 30 years later, I, I rediscovered... Oh, God, that ages me. I rediscovered the cassette at the back of a cupboard, stuck it in a record, and I knew the words off by heart. And this, again, this is the time when Tom was at his height. You know, could be a bit, a bit joking now, yeah, but he, his acting was powerful and serious. And the voice, as he narrates the story, it's absolutely hypnotic. The story's a bit near, but who cares? I mean, where else are you going to find the fourth Doctor? saying a line like, um, singing and dancing into a side street, I managed to give the monster a slip over a background dream singing Hello, Dolly. And you're still, you don't laugh because you're still scared by the seriousness, seriousness of what's happening. I mean, it's all in your imagination with this because it's an audio. So it's all... Oh, yes, oh, exactly. So yeah. there's no dodgy special effects or anything. It's... So um, coming to the end of this podcast now... Um... So thank you everyone for listening. Um, yeah. Um, thank you to our guest Doc Who. Bye bye. And we will see you. In, we won't see you. You'll hear us uh, next time. <laughs> Thank you.